So Melinda, I'm going to lead off with you first. And we have this debate sometimes uh, on how you should be renting student housing. Should you be renting it by the door or should you be renting it by the bed? So Melinda, let's just first start with the definition of this, okay? And, and, and talk about your approach and the, the advantages and disadvantages of each, okay? Okay. There's really two ways you can rent student housing. The first one is by the door, which the students sign a joint and several lease. Um, they're equally responsible for the rent. If one of them fails, they all have to pitch in to pay or find somebody else. Obviously, from a manager standpoint, that's the easiest because you're guaranteed you have to sign less leases, but you also don't have to go out and find students as other people as ones leave. On a by the bed basis, each student signs an individual lease. Um, parents really love that because then they're not committing themselves to the vagaries of student habits. But if that student leaves or if the year ends, you wind up having to fill a lot more spaces that way. There's advantages and disadvantages to each. Obviously, the advantage to joint in several is less leases to sign, less turnover to do since you're not going to turn over units that somebody is still staying in. Um, the disadvantage is that you lose a market share there. There's, a, there's always a certain part of the market that doesn't want to make that commitment, especially yes. if you're in a market that has a lot of international students. Um, international students don't like to commit themselves to that joint in several lease. Often they are coming to the states or to Canada for the first time, and they don't know anybody, so they don't have a group of people to do that with. So you're limiting yourself in the market segment if you do it that way. On an individual bed basis, though, you're limiting yourself sometimes also if you're in a market that wants a lot of group leases, and it just really depends on your market. You could have a market that wants a joint and several lease and you're only offering individual leases, you're going to lose a large share of that market if you don't have vacant apartments that they can all go into together. So there's pros and cons to each one. Another pro and con is how long do you have to turn the building at the end of, at, at the, end of the semester? If you have a 24-hour turn where they're moving out one day and moving in the next, you almost have to do joint and several. There's almost no way to turn a building of 500 individual students in one day. So. Okay. Ho, what are your thoughts on by the bed versus by the door? Well, uh, I can only comment sort of in Waterloo. In Waterloo, we started off renting houses, and in all of our houses, we rent uh, by, the, uh, by the, uh, the door, by the unit, right? And they all sign uh, group leases, so they're joined and severally liable. But in the uh, purpose-built student buildings, because of the nature of what you're seeing now, which is bed-bath parity, five beds, five... Uh, five baths, you're getting a lot of individuals that are signing up. You can't say no to them because, you know, in, in all realistic uh, views, the, the parents won't sign on or don't want to sign on and be responsible for everybody else. So we take on everything. Ideally, we'd want all group leases because that would make our jobs a lot easier. Glenn, what does the university want to see off campus? The, what, what the, um, by the bed, by the door, does it matter to you? I don't think it really matters to the university. The, the experience for universities is mostly by the bed, um, is how they rent it out. I think as far as off campus, I don't think the university really has any preferences. I would certainly agree that the, the traditional model has been by the door uh, for off campus, but I don't think the university has an interest okay. one way or the other. Okay, Joe, from a, from a legal standpoint, what are the nuances for a landlord by the bed versus by the door? Well, uh, as has already been pointed out, by the door is much simpler, it's a single lease, um, but uh, the preference for a significant component of the off-campus market is to go by the bed. And what we do is we create a, a leasing document that basically binds parents to an exclusive use area, which is the bedroom, but uh, joint and several liability for the common areas. That way the parents are only guaranteeing their own children's rent as opposed to everybody's. Um, it's operationally, it's a little more labor intensive because you do have to deal with situations where one person's leaving, another one's coming in. And you also want a fixed termination date uh, so that you don't have problems at the end of the term in doing the turnovers. Uh, but all of those things can be managed. It's just much more labor intensive when you're doing it by the bed. Any more comments on that? It's an important topic. Yes, Actually, I have a question. At the end of the fixed term, does it revert to a month to month or do you go for a resign? Well, it depends on your this jurisdiction. Ontario but yep. In Ontario, it always uh, becomes a statutory month to month tenancy, and there are leasing strategies that we use to avoid some of the complications of that as well. 
Um, there's both leases, leasing and collection strategies to avoid problems at the end of the term. Right, so Joe, just to explain, in Ontario here, you come and you sign a 12-month lease. As a tenant, you don't have to sign another lease. You just automatically go month to month. That's right, and, and the dilemma for operators of yes. student housing is what happens, you know, what's going to happen April 30th, which is typically uh, the termination date, um, if they don't if they don't get notice, especially if they don't get enough advance notice, then it's just nothing but confusion. Um, so there are lots of strategies, though, that individual operators will use so that they get notification well in advance that that, that tenancy, that room, or that building, or sorry, that unit is going to be vacant, and they start leasing it up. Because that's really January to April is one of the most uh, active periods. Okay, so maybe when I ask you that last question, I do share one piece of advice you've never shared before. You can tell us what one of those strategies are. I'll come back to that. Okay, later, good, yeah. good, good. Richard, you had a question? I, I just had one comment. I was down in, in the Miami area um, meeting with one of the universities down there, and they have a unique um, semester system that is less than one year. And so they've asked us to help them market the student off-campus student housing there to, pick, uh, to get landlords to sign an eight-month lease. And that has been hugely beneficial for... Uh, for the students that aren't fixed to a one-year lease. So some flexibility on leasing could be uh, a valued idea as well. You know, go ahead, go ahead Melinda. I, I think that's an important point. Um, if you're operating in a market that really is a nine-month market, one of the strategies we've used before is we take what you would normally expect to get in a year, you condense that down into nine payments, they sign the nine-month lease, and a lot of times they're happy with that because they're not liable then in the summer for utilities, um, damage if their roommates damage the apartment and they're not going to be there. It, and I thought when I first tried it, it was going to be a really hard sell because it's quite an uptick in I mean, rent. these kids study math, right? And it worked. It's okay, the math. Yeah. It worked. So. Right. Okay. That's, that's interesting that, that it would work. So you take 12 months rent, you cram it into nine months, and you say you've got a nine-month lease. Right? Joe? Um, and, and it varies from jurisdiction to jurisdiction, but in Ontario, basically, you can't have acceleration clauses. Uh, you can certainly have an eight-month lease, not a problem. You need to do a little more explaining uh, about how you arrive at the numbers you arrive at, and you need to recognize that that unit will sit vacant for the other four months. But we have a pretty rigid system here of rent controls and rules about what you can and can't do with rent. Okay, I want to ask a summary question. When you rent by the door, Who's it better for? Ho, oh, Melinda? The landlord. The landlord, right? Melinda? The landlord and the parents. Yep. Landlord. It's the landlord. Okay, so who's our customer? It's the, the parents, parents. Right? And, and we get away with stuff like this in this market because we don't have a lot of competition. But as that competition starts heating up, you're actually going to say to yourself, what does the customer want? Right? So if you're going to rent by the bed, who's it better for? Well, that, that's why we do the hybrid leases that, um, that basically carve out the responsibilities of the student. The parent is comfortable with that, they're happy with that, and yet you can still have a single lease that binds uh, all of the parties together. Okay, good. Any more comments? Everyone understand the concept of buy the bed versus buy the lease? Right? Very, very important concept. Go ahead, Sam. I think there's a technical term for that, SOL. Yeah, but sorry, go ahead, guys. Yeah. SOL is the most uh, direct way of putting it. Um, in most municipalities, uh, there is no such bylaw. Oh, sorry. Oh, forgive me. The question was, forgive me, in the city of Ottawa, you can't put a lock on an interior bedroom door. So if you build a three-bedroom or four-bedroom, typically what we're talking about here, we have, we didn't say it, but we implied that, door, that that door would be lockable. Students want community, but they want privacy. So apparently in Ottawa, you can't do this. And the gentleman has asked, you know, what, what do you do, right? Well, uh, this is self-serving, but you hire a lawyer and you yeah. challenge the bylaw because yeah. under provincial jurisdiction, which is superior to municipal legislation, uh, you can have a lock on those individual doors as long as the landlord has a key. Um, and, you know, the, uh, that makes the parents feel more comfortable. It makes the individual tenants feel more comfortable. 
and uh, there's certainly nothing illegal about it. And, and as long as the landlord has a key for emergency purposes, that kind of thing, you're going to be fine. Okay. All right. So let's now talk about how you fill up these units, right? The leasing date is one day. It's either May or September and things like that. You're talking about sort of the new marketing method. Steve, maybe you can comment on social marketing and where you see its place in student housing. Sure. Right. Um, yeah, one thing, important thing to think about when you think about social or mobile is it's not a standalone solution by yes. any means. It's a, it's a piece of a larger puzzle um, that is kind of coming in with this new form of marketing. And what I'll talk about mostly with you guys, just because of the short time, is principles. And I think principles we can all agree on. Uh, people love a good story, right? Uh, people love bad stories because people love watching reality TV. And uh, people just love stories and kind of a human element. Uh, but you don't see, so I, I think there's value in kind of getting out of your own heads for a minute where people love a, a show like Homes on Homes, but the contractor who's tearing apart a bathroom all day is not going to go home and watch Mike Holmes do it, right? I think that there's a real opportunity how interesting uh, development is and what you guys actually do, and then telling that story across social media, it, it, it's fascinating. People, you know, there's little peepholes in the construction walls. People love to see these buildings go up, and social is the perfect avenue to tell that story of your building all the way from the rendering through the construction, through the finishing pieces. Um, so you're getting people on board before the building is even complete. Okay, great. I'm going to ask a theoretical question. You have this building that Mark and I talked about. It's for 500 beds close to university, high rise, you've got a marketing budget, let's pick a number, $100,000, keep the math simple. Where do you spend the money on a percentage basis? We'll start with Melinda and Ho first. 100 grand, how does it get spent? I think we've seen a big shift in the last probably five or six years on where you would spend that money and a lot more of it now goes towards social marketing, social media marketing, things that are gonna, students can almost market for you if you get it out there on, on Facebook or Twitter or one of those sites and they can um, send it on to their friends and they can see it and they can click on the ad. That's where you're getting the more bang for your buck these days with your website and the, the website being all inclusive and things like so that. So of that hundred grand, how many thousand dollars go to social marketing? We didn't say it was gonna be easy. Okay. It was I hope maybe you can help. No. Yeah. Probably 25 to 30%. 30% go to social marketing? Hope. Um, we, Let's just we, talk about that. You've got $100,000 to spend. How do you spend it? If we had $100,000 to spend, we would probably spend 75000 of that on online advertising, right? Um, with everything else going to probably uh, sponsorship of events, sponsorship of school teams and um, groups and everything like that. We sponsor Oktoberfest in Waterloo, which is a large, large uh, party for all the students. So, I mean, um, and we would spend probably $10 on print media. Right? Like, we don't do any more print media, really, um, and everything else goes into online advertising, which, which could be with the university, Kijiji, Craigslist, or whatever, it makes sense for regional. Everyone agree with that? So like 60, 70 percent of your money is going to go towards online advertising. So specifically what online advertising? Like Google AdWords, Facebook, we want to get down the details here. I think Kijiji is a big one, especially in Ontario. Probably 70%, 75% of our leads come from there. I think that um, click ads on Facebook, yes, things like that. Oh, any other comments specifically? Um, one of the things that we've found that's, that's really great is uh, uh, we've just discovered a new thing. It's, it's Google remarketing. It, it's amazing. I've, I don't know if you guys have ever done this. You'll Google something, and then uh, let's say you're Googling cars or whatever, and all of a sudden you're going to go to another site, and it'll just pop up again and remind you that you should buy a car. Right, so um, it's really important. Uh, we really have to pay attention to technology. We really have to leverage it, because if you don't, you're going to be left with vacancies. That's it. So those are the places that we would spend money on: Google and a little bit of Facebook. To tell you the truth, not too much. Okay, all right, good. Well, I have a question for you. You know, we talked about development earlier this morning. You get calls from private developers wanting to build both on and off campus. How do these calls go, and what do they usually lead to? How do these calls go, and what do they usually lead to? Just advice for developers coming to you saying we want to build. Sure. Um, actually, if I can just quickly comment on the on the last question before yeah. before I get into that. Um, you know, I think that universities do have an interest in where our students live. Uh, the living experience can impact their student experience, uh, and so most universities and colleges will have a listing service. 
uh, to, uh, to get information out. And I think some of that is starting to evolve a little bit more now as well. So I know this year uh, we had uh, a housing fair where uh, landlords were able to come on campus for a day and, and it was like a trade show for the students and there was a fair amount of traffic there as well. Uh, so there was some cost to that, uh, but I, I think that would be another way to uh, Money to well spent. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So you get developers calling you. Glenn, we want to come build some, you know, you've been at several schools now, right? So yep. comment on that experience when developers call. Okay, so usually um, I would say when a developer comes in to, to chat about uh, student housing opportunities, um, what I have found is developers usually have the construction knowledge uh, very sound, they've got the financial knowledge very sound. Uh, what uh, is usually the weak area is knowledge around students. Uh, knowledge around uh, what students, uh, how their life cycle moves, what their development, uh, where they're at, what their needs are, um, that t tends to be a little bit of a weaker area. And then also the other one is uh, not necessarily understanding what the university culture or university leadership is looking for. So I would certainly encourage folks to uh, look for master plans, academic plans, understanding how uh, the executive or the leadership at the university, what, what kind of priority uh, housing is playing. There's certainly some schools that it's a very high priority. And so to have some insight into that, uh, I think would be of great value for the conversations that you'll have to get into. Uh, relationships is critical. And uh, I think the and relationships take time to build. And so the, the deeper that you can uh, have those relationships over time, I think will put you in a better place. Okay, let, let's try and give the audience a sense as to how the students think. And I'm gonna give you an example. Okay, we found out in a survey that 20% of the students actually never visit the place when they rent it. Okay, now how many of you would do that, rent a place without seeing it? You probably wouldn't, but a student will do that, right? That's a fascinating statistic. So that's pretty important to your webpage then because they're gonna rent you know, an apartment based on your webpage, right? My daughter rented an apartment from one photograph on a flip phone, and that was it. That was her due diligence period, right? And her dad's a student housing guy. This is awkward, this is embarrassing, right? Okay, so um, tell us about how students think. Yeah, it wasn't on the list of questions, I know. <laughs> How do students think differently? I know that we, uh, we run a roommate finder uh, matching service, yes. which works ph phenomenal for, for matching students based on student to student instead of trying to match them to the property. That's been very successful. So if you have three students with $500 each, they want to rent something for 1500 bucks. well, they can find each other first, then go into a tenancy um, collectively instead of trying to, one person taking all the risk, trying to get two other tenants on. Um, the, the students are, are very keen, and some of these new things we've heard today that are happening in the U.S. and Canada, been, we've been you know, working with those type of, of products where they're forward thinking and um, you know, really marketing to what students want. And this is, this is the, the, the magic question is, <laughs> what students want is they want a fun place to go where they can go to school, get to campus easily. I mean, some of these campuses are you know, 10 square miles or 10 square blocks or whatever. If, if you're on one side of the campus and you want to get to the other, it's still far away. So, the distance to campus depends what side of the campus you need to go to school on because they're that big. But I think all those, all those amenities that um, we talked about earlier um, are very key in, if we're thinking about doing this in Canada um, to build uh, high quality student housing. So, you know, I see this happen in the U.S., in, in, in Austin, in Denton, in Gainesville, places like that, where there's so much competition that people are trying to create a buzz for the school. Melinda, you know what I mean by that, right? A buzz. What does that mean and how do you go about creating that buzz in these competitive marketplaces? I think you have to have a culture at the property that is really conducive to students. It gives them the amenities they're looking for. It gives them the, either if they're looking for a quiet culture, it gives them that culture they're looking for. If they're looking for a party property, which you really don't want to have, it gives them that culture. But I think that you have to create that buzz and figure out what the students want and make that the place they want to be to get what's important to them. So, you know, we often make this mistake, and I think in some of the questions I'm asked, I make a mistake, we're assuming that students are all the same. Just like seniors developers assume that seniors are all the same, right? They're as diverse as the general population, right? So, I think it's important that as a developer when you're going out and you're looking at these different schools and you're looking at these different markets, you really have to get to know what the population of that particular school is like. Because there are 17 projects in my portfolio, I have 17 completely different student cultures. And you have to get to know those cultures and the demographics. And the demographics will really play a large part into your operating costs sometimes. If you have a huge international population just coming to the 
to Canada, just coming to the school, they're going to require a lot more, what you almost have to say is hand-holding. They're going to require a lot more explanations of what things are. Two days ago, I spent 45 minutes with a student explaining to them what a vanity was and what a ceiling fan was so we could fill out their unit condition report. You might not have that in a school that doesn't have a large international population, so really getting to know what the demographics of that population are are very important in what their culture is. Okay, Len? If, if I could build on that, I think um, the, the explanation, the education outside the classroom, mm -hmm. for many students, this will be the first time that they will be signing a contract that they'll be engaging in some form of negotiation from a certain perspective. So I think, I think if, if you can make an effort to help them answer their questions, or better yet, anticipate and put their mind at ease uh, with what it is that they're signing, it's a lot of money to them. Um, and they are very close to their, uh, to their parents. Uh, this, this demographic, the millennial students, yes. they have a finely tuned BS meter. Um, and so they're going to be skeptical. They're going to ask questions. And so if you can anticipate some of that and answer some of those questions, I think it would, uh, it would certainly, again, put you in a better, uh, stronger position. And I think also, and this builds on what you just said, you really have to consider the parents in it because while you, the student is the one that signed the contract and they're 18 years old and yes, they're legally an adult and they can sign the contract, the parents are going to call you if they don't agree with what's in that contract, if they didn't get an opportunity to look at that contract, if they don't agree with that contract, and they'll tell you they didn't understand what they were signing no matter how clear you were. So you really have to take the parents into consideration. That adds a whole other level of communication. We call them helicopter parents. And so you're communicating with the student, you're communicating with the parent, Sometimes you're communicating with grandparents. And so you really have to look at, it's not like in multifamily where you're communicating with one person, the leaseholder, and that's it. You might communicate with four or five different people across the life cycle of that student. Okay, Hope. I think the, like, uh, what they're saying is really, really important. We really have to pay attention to this. Um, you'll sign a lease with five tenants, and for those five tenants, you'll have five sets of parents. So that's already 15 people. And then there's some of them that are divorced, so you're going to get uh, almost 20, 30 people signing one lease, oh. right? And this is a headache. Um, and, and the reality is, uh, the students, a lot of the time, she's right, like, you know, Melinda's right, they haven't signed a legal document in their lives. Um, they don't know uh, what to do. They've never lived on their, uh, on their own. They don't know how to change a light bulb. Simple things like that. They'll call you for this, right? And so what, what happens is sometimes they'll call the parents and they'll say, my lights don't work or whatever. The parents will call you and say, the, the power shut down in my house, right? And, and so you have to deal with these things. These, these helicopter parents, like we, call, we used to call them helicopter parents. We don't call them helicopter parents anymore. We call them Blackhawk parents because they're, they're coming right for you, man. They're coming to get you, right? So we're sitting there and you're on the phone with them for an hour just explaining to them why the light didn't work. It's because you need to replace it, but they don't get that. So we really have to pay attention to that when we're amenitizing buildings, right? The students like things like uh, billiards rooms, games rooms, fitness areas and everything. The parents like gates. Even though the gates might not ever close, you, you still want to have them there. You still want to have student uh, study areas so that the parents can see this when they're coming through. It's like, my Jimmy or Jenny is going to use this place to get better grades. They'll probably never use it, but you want to have it there. So this is really important for the developers to pay attention to. Okay, so I want to go back again to this idea of not all students are the same, right? They're going to want different things in the building. Do you think that in a marketplace with lots of student housing where there's some competition, you could have a building that said, we have a no drinking and no alcohol policy? It's just a question. I don't think you could do that, no. Wrong. Melinda? I think that you would have to do it on a very limited basis by floor or by wing of a building. Sure. I think there's always a market for that. There's a market for anything you want to make a market for. You can't do a whole building that way. Sure. Um, they tend to think if you do the building that way that they're li still living on campus and they've moved off campus because they wanted a little more freedom. Do you want any comment on that? Uh, th there is a market for it, but you, ha you still the parent, have, to, anyways, yeah. you have to remember the fundamental thing that it's, it's the children, really children, that you're going to be managing. And their, their view of what they want and their parents' view can be very different. Um, so the parents may want that kind of building, but the kids, there's less likelihood that they'll want that. They'll want the freedom. Okay, so we really haven't tested this marketplace in Canada in terms of how high can rents go. Anyone have a feeling as to how high rents could go in a major Canadian city? Let's pick Toronto or Ottawa. I think that um, we, we deal per a bed, lot. Per bed in a luxury student property. 
it's just to define There's definitely a premium can be charged, especially for international students or any, yes. anybody who's setting their, their student, you know, inter-province, interstate, or outside of, out of the area. Um, you know, if the security becomes very important, quality of life, your parents will pay more um, if the parents are backing it for uh, a place for their kid to go that's going to be safe and the kind of property that they want their kid to live in. So I think there's a premium right there that um, speaks for itself. How much, Richard? 20%. 20% on the base rent the that base other rent, students yeah. are charging. What, what do you think, Melinda and Home? Um, you know, I remember like three years ago, we got our first student, purpose-built student building, and uh, we're really happy because it meant uh, a lot more money for the company and everything, new cars, really cool. And then uh, what happened was the developer came to us and was like, we want you to rent these places for six thirty-five a month per room. And we're like, that's crazy. That's never going to happen because it's Waterloo. It's not Toronto, right? Uh, in Toronto, it wouldn't make sense. You could pay $1,000 a room. You could, you could pay more than that, right? But we thought that in Waterloo, there, the ceiling was... was that was too high, and we were wrong, dead wrong. We got, we got fully rented 10 days before the deadline of September the 1st, and, uh, and we managed to do the same thing and even raise the rent the next year. And now you're seeing rents in Waterloo that are above $800 for a room that you share. Um, you know, you have a bed and a bath, but there's penthouse suites that are available in Waterloo for 800 plus uh, a room. But the reality is you can't rent 5,000 of these you can rent a few of them. It's a, it's, a, it's a parent, but it's a limited exactly. market just like exactly. any sector, right? So we should cater to all of them. Exactly. So there is a big, there is a premium market available, I think, in all markets. I don't know. No, really. Okay. Melinda, how high can rents go? You, you, you manage all over the place. I think they go as high as the market drives them. Yeah. I think that, you know, when you have competition that has the same amenities and things, it stabilizes them a little bit. But I think that if you have a product that is unique to that market, you can drive rents a lot higher. Yeah, I think you can hit $1,000 in Toronto um, widely. I don't think it's a top, it's the tip of the marketplace. I think it's a pretty broad marketplace in Toronto. When you just look at conventional apartment rents and you go to two bedroom condos that are renting for 17, 1800, 1900 dollars per month, those students are almost paying that with no student amenities. Now you're close to the school and it's amenitized perfectly for them. I think you can get a thousand. Glenn, you, uh, universities are charging almost that on an eight month lease. Yeah, um, I think, well, I'd, uh, I, I don't think we're quite that high uh, on, a, on a per month basis. Well, what um, was Ryerson? Ryerson uh, would have, it would have been around eight, 800 yeah. per month, but that, again, that's only an eight, eight month lease, right. um, which is different. When you're signing a 12 month lease, that can, uh, that can uh, lead out to some additional uh, charges. If I could just uh, comment or just build on one of the uh, uh, comments made this morning that uh, the rising student de debt and the rising uh, tuition, um, I, I wonder what impact that will have over the long term. Uh, I know that the, the great increase in, in tuition that happened uh, in England a few years ago, uh, actually for the first time you started to see a, a decline in enrollment and, and the, the long steep climb we've been on uh, around enrollment and tuition uh, increases. Um, the England experiments taught us that maybe there is a, a, a ceiling for this. So it's something to be mindful of for sure. Okay, well, and I think something else to tag on um, is you have to also be mindful and really be in the know and really be researching what is going on with provincial governments as far as OSAP and financial aid and is that being cut back? Because if you're raising prices and financial aid is being cut back, there's going to be a huge gap there that students are going to be able to expect it to fill or the parents, and that can sometimes be a tough sell if they're having to come up with extra money for tuition because it went up also. So you really have to know what all of the factors are that are leading to, you know, the economics for the students. Okay, so we've talked this morning about why this business is, is so attractive and that you're getting more dollars per square foot than conventional apartments. You can get leased up very quickly and, you know, all in one day, September 1, or, you know, over the summer you can get leased up and things like that. Those are very positive things that bring people to student housing. Let's not talk about sort of the challenging things about student housing. What can go wrong? Someone's sitting out here saying, you know, I'd like to build student housing. What do they need to learn about the property management side of it that maybe isn't that obvious? Joe, why don't you, why don't you talk about that first? Well, uh, again, you're, you're managing people that don't have a lot of experience in the world. They don't really necessarily have a lot of uh, accountability or responsibility. And so it, it's trying to manage that. And I think one of the most effective ways you do that is by ensuring that you have guarantors you have parents you can call, you have the contact information, and uh, the parents are usually, they, they won't believe you at first, uh, that their little Johnny has done this or that, but 
Uh, if, if you have a good, manage, a good disciplined management team, um, you'll drive that message home and you'll get those people under control. Going through formal legal processes and stuff like that is an absolute last resort. Uh, I find that the most practical advice uh, you can give is make sure that the parents are readily available and get them under control through the parents. First, Steve, and then Glenn, I'd like you to comment what you do on campus. Yeah. Sure. I think one of the things that uh, property managers might not consider, first of all, is the way the social web has changed reputation management. Yes. Um, we have a lot of clients who are focusing more and more on their brands. They want people looking for their brand. And for a lot of you guys, I assume it's, you know, you didn't tweet your breakfast this morning. I doubt you took a picture. And if you did, I wouldn't let us know that because that's embarrassing. But uh, the first instinct of a student, when they see something wrong, they're probably going to take a picture of it and yes. put it up on their Facebook page. And you're oh, look what happened here. And all their friends are, oh, that sucks. Like, you must be so pissed. And this is unbelievable. So what we say is, you know, a lot of people don't want to get into social media because they don't want people talking about them. Well, that conversation is happening whether you like it or not. So you have two choices. You can participate or you can try to pretend it doesn't exist. And when people are doing their due diligence, they're going to come across these types of things and you could lose leases that way. So you're saying ignore social media at your peril? Yeah, I mean, the CEO of Facebook would say the same thing and you could argue it's just part of this kind of agenda. But right. really, the younger generation, they talk about everything. They, you know, I'm hiring people from Gen Y all the time. I'll always look at their social presence and it's ridiculous. The people who are looking for jobs the day before tweeted, you know, I love not giving an F about life or something. And I'm like, well, I'm not hiring that person. Like, forget that. Right. Right, right. They, they have no concept that this actually matters, so they're putting everything online. doesn't matter what it is, especially if it's an inconvenience. Oh, look at my broken door. Look at my broken light. Look at this mildew. You know, this is outrageous, right? Did, does it almost get blown out of proportion because it's so oh, easy to communicate a negative message? Yeah, but what we do is we help, like we've had the worst case scenarios. We've had people's apartments catch fire who are our clients who have a social media presence. And you can see the conversation between the tenant and the landlord. You know, my apartment is on fire. You know, we're calling 911, like get out of there type stuff. Like this is all happening in real time and the building's piling on, are you okay? You know, th this is the reality of, of a social world. So you just want to be aware of those type of reputation management implications that places like Google, Facebook, and Twitter now present. You know, a lot of operators will be online. They'll be part of that system so that they, they're uh, top of mind when it comes to communications. You don't need to fill out a maintenance form. You can just contact them directly and they can get in on the conversation and at least try to preserve their reputation if, uh, if things there, are going is sideways. There, is there a legality problem with talking on social media and responding? For example, there's obviously a cost. I mean, who could represent your company at the high level to talk about technical or, or legal things? And you respond to a tenant or a student using a social media can that be used against you later as um, being, uh, you know, Anything you binding? say can be used against you. So, yeah, but, I don't want to spend too long it's, on this. It, it's operational things. Yeah. Like, this is when the fire inspections are going down. The parents like to see that. The students like to see that. This is what's happening at the front door. This is what's happening out back. Those kinds of things, they're not going to hurt you. They're going to help you. They'll let the students and the parents know that you're, you're there. Right. So, you know, I've been in the student business 10 years ago. Before I got into it, I never would have guessed some of the management problems that you would have in student housing. We don't want to just sell this thing through rose-colored glasses. There are issues that happen. I never ever thought about a student suiciding in the building that they lived in and the impact on that building and things like that. What are some of those examples? We don't have to get into great detail here, but there are things that happen with young people that aren't going to happen in conventional apartments, or certainly not as often. Glenn? So I think many of you will probably think you're getting into property management. Yes. Um, and in fact, you, what you have to be careful of, or the, the potential is there for you to get into people management. And so I think you have to be very mindful of that. Um, certainly, when, when you asked earlier, Derek, about what universities do, there's a, a great deal of infrastructure that universities have built up over the decades uh, to support the, the, the student experience, the, the, the experience that the students are having as a student, and really to embed the living experience into their, their learning. Uh, and so there's student staff that live on the floors, t tend to be at, a, at a, a better ratio than it would be for something off campus. There tends to be full-time staff that are dedicated to support those student staff. 
Um, this is not, these are not normally things that we see in, in a lot of off-campus properties. Um, but then uh, there, there tends to be a more well-defined um, uh, code of conduct or, or standards for living in, and then there, there can be uh, boards or um, people who are dedicated to serving those students in those areas. So those, are, those tend to be things that uh, exist more at college and universities. Uh, sometimes they, they can overlap into off-campus, but for the most part they don't. Melinda? I think too you have to be careful when you're hiring your management team and you're hiring people to work in the building that they are coming to it from a multifamily standpoint that they realize exactly what they're getting into. I interviewed a girl a couple of weeks ago for an assistant manager position and I asked her why she was leaving her present job and she said I just feel like I'm a social worker. I don't want to be a social worker. I'm like okay because I'm thinking that's just what you're going to be when you come work for me is you're going to be a social worker. You're going to have 500 of them though, you know. And so you've really got to pick your staff and pick your staff to under, that yes. understand students yes. and what the job really entails. So those guys going from your apartment portfolio may not be the right guys to be managing your student housing portfolio. Not if they don't understand what they're getting into right. and they're not willing. If you don't want to be a social worker, you're not going to Right. In. Okay, great. So we've got a question from the audience. Just a question about the um, leases basically when you have international students coming in. Yes. Like you'll have some kind of vacancy that suppose uh, the peak is in September to December, right? So how would you... Well, typically the lease is going to go one year, but... but right? Most of those international students, they just come in for four months. Well, okay, so there's a couple of questions here. Just one is, what do you do with a student who comes in for four months, right? But the other question I'd add to that is you have an international student here, you get a parental guarantee. What does it mean if the guy gets on a plane and goes back to Peru after two months because he doesn't like school, right? Well, the guarantee doesn't mean anything in, yeah. in those situations. Uh, it's not much comfort. And I've seen a lot of managers who um, basically, uh, while you, it's not legal in Ontario, you can certainly ask for the money up front, you just can't require it. And that's the way to deal with uh, the guarantee. You've sure. got your security in place, but you have to recognize that that's a risk you're taking on. Um, you can have a four-month lease, that's not a big deal. Uh, if that's the way you want to run your operation. A lot of people like to know that they have at least uh, occupancy for the eight months, the full, full amount of the term, reduces the amount of turnover. Um, I've seen leases that are structured for the length of degrees. So you have a four-year lease, but you have an opting out option. Mm. Uh, give notice Color. by the end of December that you're going to be leaving and we'll let you out. Um, and what that does is it, it basically gives you notice that it's going to become vacant, gives the parents and the students some comfort that they can get out, but otherwise that they've got a place for four years so that they can do their degree. Okay, I'll say one thing about international students. At a building in Montreal where the building got built but the 11th floor was delayed because it was an add-on, so we had these empty units for the year. We rented them to language school students on shorter term leases at huge premiums. Because what do you do when you come into Montreal and you're coming there for three months or four months. Like, where do you find a place to live? So we're talking about taking rents of 30, 40, 50 percent, almost, that would make the same amount of money on eight months than it would on, on the 12th. Linda? I think it also goes to, and, and Ho can attest to this in the Waterloo market, um, there's some markets that are huge sublet markets where students from the University of Waterloo go on co-op every four months and they sign a year lease and the months that they're not there, they will sublet their apartment out for those four months to another student that needs that four month space. And so you, knowing your market and knowing if that is a huge sublet market is important because then if you have someone coming in wanting a four month lease, say, you know, post an ad on Kijiji, you'll find someone that wants to sublet to you for those four months or something like that. Oh, quickly and then we'll go to the audience here. I think it's really important that um, if, if the property manager is doing the right job, then every single lease that you're signing up is 12 months or longer. That's it. So I mean, uh, let the kids that are coming in for four months deal with themselves, sublet from their friends, or through whatever form they have. There's not much of a summer sublease market in university towns. There might be in Toronto, but is there a, 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 a sublet market in Waterloo in the summer or in London, real quickly? In, in Waterloo, like, um, again, like, the, no, there, there's a lot of sublets actually happening, and a lot of people are discounting their rents to make it, uh, to, to get out of the city, right? There's just not enough jobs. You could so, sublet for a case of Heineken, I think. Yeah, you, you practically could. You know, like, there's yeah, places yeah. that will go for $250, $300 a month, and originally they were paying six, five hundred. dollars But Heineken, imported beer. Heineken, not really good beer. Not. Low. Okay, so there's a question from the audience. Bed bugs have become quite the pest, and I'm just wondering, what measures do you take to ensure bed bugs don't come into your buildings? Okay, and so just a question about bed bugs, yeah? Yeah, and if they are in your building, what do you do to get rid of them? 
Okay, so victim. bed bug question. Yuck. Okay. <laughs> we don't get bed bugs. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Melinda, just quickly. Um, there's nothing to, you can do to ensure that they don't come into your building. What you do is as soon as you know that they're there, you call the pest control company, have them come, professionally take care of it, um, instruct the students on how to take care of their things. And it's not a huge problem in Waterloo or the markets I've been in. I know in Toronto it's a huge problem in Montreal. You just have to control it as best you can. Um, hopefully they tell you about it sooner rather than later. It's, there's not much you can do about controlling it. And don't pretend that they're not there if you hear yeah. about them. Deal with them right away because they don't okay, go away. Okay, next question. And, and, and no more people can go up there. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. We need brief answers. Thank you. Um, uh, what do you do? Um, we talked about having special rules maybe on one special floor. It would be designated uh, no alcohol or something like that. Do you get a population of young students who have children? Oh. When they have a child, if they're coming to school in a town other than the one that they live in, do they have the child in the room with them and then... So you're talking about family housing, really, to some extent, right? Well, if, if there was a student who was still, um, yes. still single. Sure. Melinda, have you seen that? Never seen it? Oh, yeah, we've seen it, but we don't try not to do it, um, especially in Canada. It's... There, it's just not equipped for that. The student can't afford it for one thing. You've got a five bedroom apartment and that student would have to pay for all five bedrooms. We'll refer, refer them out to a multifamily property. They're just probably gonna stay in a conventional building. So right. they wouldn't be able to rent a room in a four, four bedroom, um, no. Understand, unless they had understanding roommates, yeah. Okay, no, so Sam, no, last no. question and then make a brief. Yeah. Um, in Canada, when I rent uh, all-inclusive, it's usually all utilities included. Uh, when I visited the U.S., I noticed that a lot of uh, companies have a cap on utilities, $60 a month, and then you pay extra. How okay. common is that, and is that legal in Canada? So, you great question, it? Joe. So, if a building is, you know, you want to charge back the utilities to the tenants, yeah. some people do sort of a cap, and if you go over the cap, you know, then the student yeah, pays it. Typically, you see that in a building that isn't sub-metered. So there's, right. you know, they want to cover their utility costs. Uh, what they'll do is they'll say, we're charging you a separate charge of, let's say, $50 a month over the 12 months, and at the end, we'll do a reconciliation. The reconciliation and the charge you do is illegal, so you're taking on a risk. And there's really no incentive, you know, on the tenant um, to control their consumption. They just, they're just paying the extra. What you're really hoping for is that at the end of the tenancy, uh, they don't know their rights and so they pay the excess. Um, it's, it's just a, it's a risky game. It's legal as long as they're paying it separately. It's that reconciliation at the end. If it's less, if, if you're gonna give them a credit, it's not a problem. But if you want more money, it's a problem. And, okay, great, Melinda? And usually what you're seeing in the US is it's not, we don't have to reconcile it and usually the cap is low enough that they're always going over to knowing you money anyway. Okay, great, we're gonna do our last question now. I'm gonna start with you, Glenn. One piece of advice to this audience that you've never said publicly before. Uh, the one piece of advice, I guess, that I would offer is uh, I, I disagree with some of the, uh, the earlier suggestions around uh, one bedroom, one bathroom. Uh, my, my thinking on that is I think you're, you're basically embedding uh, loneliness Hmm. Uh, into the uh, into the student experience, He's right? Um, and I think uh, what the impact that, that could have on you um, is the fact that uh, if these students aren't interacting, if they're not socializing, uh, then their experience will be less satisfactory, um, and that you know then there's not going to be that word of mouth type of advertising. Certainly, from the university and college side, one of the things that we have been getting into in the last few years is mental health issues. And I think one of the ways to, to uh, address that is to encourage socialization, encourage friendships, encourage networks. So, uh, so I would actually discourage uh, the one bed, one bath. I think uh, students don't want community bathrooms, um, but they, will, they are willing to share with uh, one or two or three others. So I think uh, semi-private bathrooms work. That, that's a really deep answer. I wish we had more time to drill down on that. I think I, I agree with you that that's what's good for the students, but what they want is something else. And that's the thing. Okay, Steve. So from a marketing perspective, we've just been getting uh, recently a lot of data, not only from our own um, operations, but from other people in, in the industry around um, basically 
hitting people over the head with call to action buttons on your web presence. So ours are actually quite classy and they're very persistent um, and they get around a 16% conversion rate to all the web traffic for our clients to their mobile site. Uh, apparently you can even go more aggressive and get better rates. You wanna make it stupid simple for these people to phone you, to email you, um, without having to think about it or leave their phone or, or do anything that's inconvenient for them. Great advice. Joe? Just, uh, this is more related to operations. Um, make sure you have a system in place right around the end of April. Uh, first of all, at least 60 days before, get notices out to the tenant, whether it's on social media or whatever. Remind them you need 60 days notice minimum to get out or they're going to be liable. Uh, follow that up a month ahead of time. Do the outgoing inspections. Make sure that you keep sending out reminders about booking the elevator because it's all going to happen quickly. And, uh, and then make arrangements with recycling companies, Goodwill or whatever, to come by and pick up all the furniture that's going to be thrown out in your parking lot so that you keep it up, keep it clean, and then you're in a position to re-rent uh, and turn the unit over quickly when tenants are coming in on May 1st. Melinda? I would say, and I'm going to kind of tag on what Greg said in the last session, um, if you're a developer, know your investment criteria, stick to that investment criteria, and if the deal doesn't fit, feel free to say no, just say no. Okay, Hotek? Um, I think this is something that we sort of always touch on, but not really, and I'm going to directly say it. I think one of the biggest amenities in student housing right now is internet and the quality of internet that you're getting. Yes. It's really funny because we had a building that uh, didn't have hot water and heat for three weeks, like three weeks, but you know what? Uh, everyone was sort of happy because they had internet. Right? So they all stayed off our backs because we got them internet in the first week. Um, it's really important and we're drawing direct correlations I think now between the quality of internet and the number of retention or the rental rate that's going on in that building. The internet is very paramount and you have to get the right team in place to bid down that internet through Rogers or Bell or whoever, whatever big company you want to use. But internet is very important. Great answer. Richard? I'm um, considering hiring a marketing company instead of trying to do your marketing yourself. Yes. And there's economies of scale that fit in there really well. They're buying power through, through a cross section of other clients. Um, they, know, they know contacts and they're going to cover off all the bases that you may not think about, um, which happens a lot, especially here in Canada. I, I work a lot with marketing companies in the US and it's much more efficient for us. And I know that uh, they get better rates from us for, for, from doing that because they just have the clout. So, and they're also, if you don't like them, you fire them and you move on as opposed to being having an employee that's trying to do this, trying to learn your company and all that kind of stuff. So.